are currently in listen-only mode. Number two, after Bob and Phil deliver the presentation, we'll have some time to answer any questions from the audience and have a few members of our investment committee here in the room to assist with that. Please feel free to submit your questions at any point during the session. You do not need to wait until the end to submit a question. When, on your screen, you should see a dialog box labeled questions. By entering your questions there, they'll come directly to our team. At this point, everyone should see a slide with the title that says Mid-Year Market Update, Perspectives from the Halfway Point. If you don't, please type something in the chat area and we will try to troubleshoot. Finally, our general counsel has asked that I remind you that today's session may discuss the performance of some strategies and that past performance is not a guarantee of future results. I now hand it over to Bob. Good afternoon. We hope you are having a great summer. I'd like to start our presentation by reading this quote to you by the esteemed investor Warren Buffett. An argument is made that there are just too many question marks about the near future. Wouldn't it be better to wait until things clear up a bit? You know the pros. Maintain buying reserves until current uncertainties are resolved, etc. Before reaching for that crutch, face up to two unpleasant facts. The future is never clear, and you pay a high price for a cheery consensus. Uncertainty actually is the friend of the buyer of long-term values. Warren Buffett. In the 32 years plus that we have been in this business, there has always been uncertainty. And actually, when there isn't, you better really worry. We always have what we call a wall of worry. And where we are at this juncture in the year, it's no different. There are concerns that we have to be considering. And we're going to go into them. I'd like to just show you the agenda for today's webinar. We're going to discuss the current macroeconomic observations that we think are relevant. We're going to talk about the question marks that Warren Buffett refers to, at least at this point in time, for all of us as investors to digest. We're then going to have an approach to 2015, which reflects that which we've written on our recent quarterly letter that you should just have received. Bill's going to be responsible for that section. And then we're going to open it up for questions and answers. And our whole investment committee, at least those of us that are here and not on vacation, we will be happy to try and answer those questions for you. So first things first, we'd like to turn to some current macroeconomic observations that you should be worried about or concerned about. This first page is quite interesting and very important to us as investors. It shows the 10-year, the top chart, the 10-year Treasury historical yield. And as you can see, if you look on the extreme left, the 1993, for these taxable Treasuries, they peaked at about 8% in 1994. And today, as of June 30, the 10-year rate was at 2.35%. And actually, today, it's 2.24%. This is historically very, very low. If you go to the chart beneath it, because we are bond investors, as you know, we buy both treasuries and municipal bonds for our clients, you'll see also the AAA municipal bond historical yield. Again, going back to 1993, we're in 1994 or so, these bonds peaked at over 6%. Wouldn't it be nice if we could get 6% tax-free bonds again, AAA? Uh, but today, the yield is closer to 2.3%. These are very, very low interest rates and have actually been of great concern to investors because on an after-tax, after-inflation basis, we're barely making the rate of inflation. And in some cases, there's actually a negative yield. This is actually helping home buyers if you're out looking for a mortgage, but it's hurting savers. And many of our investors are obviously savers and would like a higher yield. And some of our investment strategies, such as dividend growth, uh, try and help in that situation. Uh, but again, the point here is that interest rates are very, very low. And that if there's going to be a Fed lift off in September or December, in our opinion, it's no big deal. 
we're not at the crisis anymore, rates should be normalized, and we'll have more to say about that in a little while. But again, we are sitting mid-year 2015 with very, very low interest rates, which in some cases is helpful, and in some cases it's hurting savers. We turn to the next observation, which is a sort of a general picture of our economy. It's very interesting. The chart on the left, real gross domestic product year over year percentage change, shows a picture going back to 1966 to the current of the average GDP growth or gross domestic product growth that our country has enjoyed. And that average is about 2.9%. Expansion average, or that which we've had since the decession, somewhere between a depression and a recession of 2008 and 9, has been closer to a 2.2 percent average. So, despite the fact that we're modestly growing, it's somewhat below the average increase for GDP over that long period of time. We believe at First Long Island that we are in a range of between 2 and 3 percent, and that's despite the very low interest rates that we spoke about earlier, and the Fed funds rate, which we'll show you in a little while, which is still at zero. So what does that mean? We have a modestly growing economy that's not inflationary. Interest rates are low, and that's not bad. Perhaps the economy would be growing more robustly if we had greater cooperation in Washington, and we had some fiscal policy initiatives to complement the monetary policy of the Fed. You know, that's hoping for a lot. We'll see what happens. If you look at the chart on the upper right, all employees, total private industries, this is also very interesting and shed some optimistic light on our economy. We've gained 12.8 million jobs since the tremendous recession back in 2008 and 9, where we lost almost 9 million jobs. So we've had and continue to have solid employment growth but in many cases, they're low paying jobs. So the good news is we've gained a lot of jobs. We'd like them to be higher paying. And of course, as you've all probably heard or read, uh, wage increases have been very low. That's also an issue that the Fed is confronting. But so far, we've got, and we continue to have, there's an, actually an employment report on Friday, tomorrow, uh, we have solid employment growth. And we at First Long Island expect that to continue at approximately 180 to 200,000 jobs per month. That's great for the economy. The one negative aspect of this, which is reflected in the chart on the bottom right, labor force participation rate, <coughs> excuse me, as you can see, the labor force participation rate has dropped rather significantly. And that's the result of two things. One, demographics and the aging of America, and some people dropping out of the workforce because they no longer wish to work. But it also reflects those people who have skills, and they're not able to find skilled jobs, and they've become disgruntled, and they've dropped out of the uh, workforce. The overall picture on this page is promising. We have modest growth, which means we shouldn't be terribly concerned about inflation. We'd like it to be a little bit more robust, and perhaps we'll find that in the future. We have significant job growth, which helps the economy, puts more money into circulation, and the jobless rate has dropped to about 5.3%. But the expense of this has been the labor force participation rate, which we wish was a little bit higher. <clears throat> this is actually the lowest it's been since the 1970s. So the economy is recovering modestly, and that's pleasant news for us as investors. We turn to the next observation, and this is very, very key. A lot of people are worried the stock market's at a high. I'm worried. Uh, there are two factors that affect that, and one of them is on this page, and that's S&P index earnings per share. There's a reason why we believe the stock market is at or near a high. And that is because earnings for the largest companies in America are growing robustly, and they're at or near record levels. The fact that they're at or near record levels is also reflecting some negative aspects of the economy. And that is the rising value of the dollar is affecting multinational companies in the S&P 500. So those companies, 
like Coca-Cola or Qualcomm or Pfizer, Apple or Google, that are doing business overseas, because of the strength in the dollar, the value of those earnings from overseas are discounted when they're translated back to uh, American dollars. And that's actually been a negative for S&P earnings. So had the dollar been more stable and those local operations around the world have been as good as they've been or as successful as they've been, uh, S&P earnings would even be higher. Another factor affecting negatively S&P record earnings are depressed oil prices. And we all see at the gas pump that oil has come down dramatically. On average in 2014, oil per barrel was about $90. Today, West Texas Intermediate is about $45 per barrel. So we've had actually a 50% decrease in the cost of oil. That also has affected energy companies in the S&P and energy service companies in the S&P. So again, we've had record earnings. Record earnings support record high stock prices. That's a positive. And the earnings would even be higher if the dollar hadn't appreciated so much and if oil hadn't collapsed as much as it had. Uh, the good news with the oil uh, decrease is that consumers are benefiting both the gas pump and in heating oil and certain businesses that use natural gas, which is also down about 30%, will also benefit. So collectively, at some point, perhaps a bit later on this year, we'll start to see the benefit of those decreased energy costs um, with consumers spending more and even feeling better about things. But the very good news on this page is if you look at the middle of this chart in 09 when we had the recession, corporate earnings have rebounded significantly and they are at or near record levels. This is very positive for us as investors. We turn to another very important page in this presentation, and that relates to valuations. Everybody is concerned that the stock markets are too high. Now, we've just established that interest rates are low. That helps stock prices. We've also just established that earnings are at record levels or near record levels without a recession in sight. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So now we come to valuations, and we at First Long Island use a number of outside economists and strategists to help us in our work. We're gatherers of information on a regular basis, as a matter of fact, on a daily basis. Uh, Strategist has prepared this chart for us. They're an outside economics consultant that we use, <clears throat> and we wanted to take a look at the average price earnings multiple in different environments over a number of years. This is actually from 1950, so we're talking about 65 years of history. And what we wanted to see is what happens when you've got a high consumer price index and what happens when you have a low price, a low CPI index uh, as it relates to price earnings multiples, which are very important to valuations in the stock market. And as you can see, in the 0 to 2% bar on this chart, representing the CPI being somewhere between 0 and 2%, the average price earnings multiple on forward 12-month earnings is 15.8 or about 16. Well, as it turns out, right now, as of June 30th, believe it or not, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, was 0. So it's somewhere between 0 to 1, 0 to 2, but at June 30th, it was 0. And our price earnings multiple on the next 12 months of earnings is 16.5, very slightly above the average for a 0 to 2 percent CPI over the last 65 years. To us, that indicates that we are not in nosebleed territory from a valuation standpoint. And I know you hear a lot of talking heads on CNBC or Bloomberg or whatever, but we deal in facts and fundamentals here, <coughs> excuse me, and we take out a lot of the a noise that you hear to try and get to what the fundamentals are. So we have a slightly higher PE, we have a very low CPI, there's no high inflation on the horizon that we can see, and we're trading at about a 16.5 next 12 months earnings multiple, which is just slightly above the historical average over 65 years for a CPI being this low. And as I mentioned in the earlier slide, 
earnings have been depressed by energy prices and earnings have been depressed by the strong dollar, uh, which makes this even a more compelling chart. And just from a historical perspective, we all remember the year 2000 when the stock market went down dramatically, about 20%. Uh, if you recall, at that time, PEs were very high. They were actually at least 25 or greater on next 12-month earnings. So if you want to talk about very high valuations, we go back to 2000 and we look at a PE of 25 versus a PE on the next 12-month earnings of 16.5. So again, from a valuation standpoint, things aren't dirt cheap as they were two, three years ago. They're reasonable, they're far from expensive, and in our opinion, it sets it up for a stock picker's market. Not everything is cheap and not everything is inexpensive, but our job at First Long Island is to invest your dollars and our dollars, remember we invest side by side with you, in companies that are growing, that are undervalued or fairly valued, but certainly not overvalued. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the market in general, in our opinion right now, is reasonably valued. It's not cheap, but it's certainly not expensive. So those who continue to say it's very expensive aren't looking at the historical facts and aren't recognizing that we don't see a recession in the near future, which would decrease earnings. So stock selection is key. We refer to it as high active share and concentrated portfolios. We turn to the next page, which gets back to interest rates again. And this page is really interesting to look at. You'll see that we peaked in the 1980-82 time frame with a Fed fund's effective rate of over 18%. Some of us remember how difficult those days were when inflation was running rampant and we could actually buy bonds that were yielding 15, 16%, but that was because inflation was huge. Because of the decession in 2008 and 9, the Fed reacting to that crisis dropped interest rates to zero. And as you look to the right side of the chart on the bottom, you'll see that the Fed funds rate has been effectively zero for a rather long period of time. The dotted red line is the FOMC year end estimate projection going out, which shows some lift off and some normalization of interest rates. But in our opinion, the impending rate increase by the Fed, which may take place in September, it may take place in December, it has been well broadcasted. It is only starting to return to normalcy because we are no longer in a crisis. We were in a crisis in 2008 and 9, and Fed Chairperson Bernanke acted responsibly he dropped interest rates to protect the country's economy and the global economy. It worked. We're out of a recession. Our stock market has rebounded. Our employment has rebounded. But we're no longer in that crisis situation. And it's actually healthy for the Fed to start lifting off with rates. Uh, our quarterly letter recites the fact that there may be some greater volatility. When the Fed does increase rates, there could be some greater volatility and the stock markets may sell off. But that's not based on fundamentals. That will be based on a knee-jerk reaction, which we believe will be temporary. So we are not concerned about this. And again, we view the impending rate increase by the Fed as reasonable, appropriate, warranted. And it may even give some investors or savers a little bit more interest income than they have right now where the Fed funds rate is at zero. So we are not concerned about the Fed increasing rates, even if it means some short-term volatility in the stock market. We turn to the next question, Mark. Ah, Greece, nice place to visit, but a lousy place for the stock market on a regular basis. We've been dealing with headlines out of Greece for the last four or five years. And we wanna show you in graphic form with this pie chart that Greece represents only a tiny part of the Eurozone's economy, perhaps 2%. It's more headline risk than substantive risk and substantive issues. Uh, it's not terribly important to the Eurozone. And the European Union is prepared to deal with whatever the eventuality is with Greece. 
As you know, there's a short-term deal in place with Greece after going back and forth, and there was a default for a, period, a short period of time. There may ultimately be a restructuring of Grecian debt or Greek debt. Again, we don't expect this to be very disruptive to the European financial system or, for that matter, to global financial markets. But we wanted to show you this slide just to put your fears at ease that Greece is a very small part of the economy and actually uh, the Greek debt is owned by the European Union and other uh, regulatory uh, agencies who can deal with any default that may take place or any restructuring that may ultimately take place. So again, are we concerned about Greece? No. It's a headline risk. It causes volatility with the market. But in our opinion, given the small size of the economy, and actually in our quarterly letter, we believe that the Greek economy is less than the size of the Connecticut economy. Again, just to put it in perspective. So this is a question mark for investors. It's more headline risk than it is a substantive issue, and we are not terribly concerned about it. But turning to another major question mark, which is more impactful than Greece, and that is China. This chart shows you that the Chinese stock market from January 1st had gone up a unbelievable 122% in a matter of less than six months, and then it corrected by 22%. That sort of volatility, that humongous increase followed by a very sharp decline, caused headlines, caused volatility in the equity markets, and caused a lot of uh, conjecture on the part of investment strategists. What we do know is the following. The Chinese economy is slowing. It's a very, very large economy. Some people's eyes, it's the second largest economy in the world. If you aggregate all of Europe, that would make Europe the second largest economy, so China perhaps then falls to the third largest economy. In any event, it's a large economy. And its growth rate is slowing from what had been the last several years, 7 to 8 percent, and perhaps even a bit higher, to perhaps where we think it will land at 5 to 6 percent, <coughs> excuse me, with what is considered to be a soft landing. So it's a very large economy, and it's slowing, and it has a relatively new stock market. We do not invest directly in the Chinese stock market at this point. Perhaps a few of our outside managers will find something in Shanghai, I'm sorry, in Hong Kong, but not necessarily directly in China. Nevertheless, the, the market has increased too dramatically. Now it's fallen, and this has caused some impact and some concern. Where we see the impact is, yes, a large economy is slowing, <clears throat> but the impact will be majorly on commodities. So part of the reason why oil is down in price, copper is down significantly in price, is because the infrastructure build out in China has slowed and is slowing rather dramatically. And the shift to a more consumer-oriented economy is taking place. As you know, we invest in companies like Yum Brands and Starbucks, as an example, and Apple, who are doing quite well in China as that emerging middle class continues to grow. And that's hundreds of millions of people, and we still think that's an opportunity. But this question mark of the Chinese stock market volatility has been one that has been in the newspapers and on the cable channels. I would also like to point out that in terms of the individual investor in China, only 10 to 15 percent, I believe, of their personal net worth is tied up in the Chinese stock market. So this increase and decrease, although emotionally it's, uh, it's troublesome to them, is not significant to the overall Chinese economy and not disruptive to their economy. But nevertheless, we believe the Chinese economy is slowing, although it is still a very significant growth factor to the global economy. Turn to another question mark that hits closer to home, and that is Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico and Puerto Rican tax-exempt bonds have been a favorite of individual retail investors for as long as I can remember. And one of the reasons for that is because the the Puerto Rican municipal bonds are considered triple exempt, which means they're exempt from federal tax, state tax, and city tax if you should live in New York City. 
there's $72 billion in outstanding debt divided up amongst a bunch of municipalities in Puerto Rico. But Puerto Rico is a commonwealth, and by the way, there is real concern as to whether that $72 billion could ever be repaid. Our best guess is it cannot. Uh, back in the old days, in the 70s and 80s, Puerto Rican debt was considered a moral obligation of the United States government, and that there would never be a failure because there was this not legal guarantee of the U.S. government, but moral obligation of that outstanding debt because Puerto Rico is a commonwealth of the United States, as is Guam, just for history purposes. <clears throat> because Puerto Rico is a commonwealth, it does not have the same bankruptcy protection that is afforded the states. There's no law that permits Puerto Rico to go bankrupt. And that creates some confusion as to what happens to Puerto Rican debt if it can't be repaid. They can't file for bankruptcy. They can try and renegotiate the restructuring. And that's exactly what's going on right now. Puerto Rican officials have until the end of August to finalize economic and fiscal reforms uh, through their various proposals. They're negotiating with hedge funds that have loaned money. There are a lot of mutual funds that have significant uh, Puerto Rican debt exposure. Of all U.S. bond funds, and we do not invest in bond funds, approximately 20% hold Puerto Rican debt. Uh, for purposes of this conversation, we only have one institutional client at for, uh, for First Long Island that holds one Puerto Rican bond. No individual client has a Puerto Rico bond. We're concerned that there could be some spillover on other municipal bonds if Puerto Rico should default or restructure. So that's a concern that we would have with the municipal bond sector. It could cause spreads to increase from treasuries, and we always look at the relationship between treasuries and Puerto Rican bonds, or Puerto Rican bonds and corporate bonds. So if there's a disruption here, it could make the entire municipal bond market a little bit sloppy. Not terribly worried about it, but it is a factor that we should mention. Uh, one, one interesting aspect of the Puerto Rico bond situation is that they overspent. It is a government, a municipality that spent more than it could and borrowed to make those spending. This also translates to some of our municipalities and states where there are unfunded pension liabilities and other things that need to be looked at. Uh, certainly, uh, states have more, far more backing and far more sources of revenue to deal with their debt situations, but we're watching that very carefully as we buy your bonds. We look to the integrity of uh, each of the municipalities that we invest in. So Puerto Rico is a question mark. Again, it's a lot of headline risk. Uh, it's a very small economy. They've overspent and overborrowed based on their spending. It's a concern, but it's not a grave concern. Uh, this is not anything new. We have actually lived through um, Stockton, California going bankrupt, Detroit going bankrupt. So these things will happen from time to time, but it is something that's on the minds of our investors and clients. So we thought we would bring it to your attention. Uh, there are question marks out there, as Warren Buffett pointed out. Meanwhile, the majority of our strategies are quite positive this year. Uh, we are pleased with the way things are. Uh, we believe that being a long-term investor will, be, will continue to be rewarded, and that there are always these question marks or wall of worry that we have to deal with, and we will continue to invest prudently in the face of those question marks. But the key to Buffett's phrase or quote is, you don't go running from investing where there's long-term opportunity even if there are some question marks that will create some short-term volatility. And now it's my pleasure to turn the presentation over to my partner, Phil Malakoff. Thanks, Bob, and uh, thank you to everyone on the webinar for joining us in this presentation. So what is our approach to 2015, or the remainder of 2015, and how are we advising our clients, given the current macroeconomic environment and question marks that Bob just detailed? So we're continuing to recommend that our clients maintain a diversified portfolio with prudent asset allocation. So what we have on slide 13 is our roadmap. And many of you have seen it, but maybe some of you haven't, or it's been a while since you've seen it. So let me just quickly provide a review. Um, what we have here are the four categories, the way that we really look at the investment landscape. 
Um, we define the investment landscape in these four categories, security investments, defensive strategies, traditional equities, and private investments. And as you move from left to right on this, we would expect each of these categories, as you move to the right, to provide slightly better returns over the long term with a bit more risk and perhaps a little bit less liquidity. So starting with the first category, security investments, those are what we feel are the safest investments. They're really the investments that let you uh, sleep at night, and they're an important part of a prudent asset allocation. And what we would recommend to our clients is that they maintain a modest allocation to this category with a focus on quality. Moving one category to the right, we have our defensive strategies. Um, these strategies are designed to participate when the equity markets do well, but protect when they don't. It doesn't mean they won't be down if the equity markets are down, but they should not be down as much as the overall market. And this is an area that we really feel clients should um, really focus on, and we would recommend that clients maintain an overweight exposure to this. And in fact, we've been making this recommendation in our quarterly letter since the first quarter of 2014. So our quarterly letter, some of you may receive. If not, you'll be receiving it shortly, our second quarter for 2015. This is the sixth quarter that we've been making that recommendation. Traditional equities are more market-like, and we would expect that investments in that category uh, would perform more in line with broader equity markets. And we would recommend that clients modestly underweight this category. And then we have private investments, which tend to be a little bit more liquid. And we would utilize those as appropriate on a case-by-case, client-by-client basis. So our approach to um, security or fixed income is to maintain a modest position. Uh, the strategies we craft for clients Focus on quality. They are typically investment grade, and most of the investments are rated A or better. Um, and we utilize bonds with short to medium term, or I should say we craft a portfolio um, that has short to medium term maturities or duration. Um, on this slide as well, we have a very interesting chart that I'd like to go into detail on. And this chart is the average bond PE or price to earnings ratio by decade, and that is calculated as the face value of the bond divided by the 10-year treasury yield. And I kind of want to start in the middle in the 1980s. Um, and I think earlier in the presentation, Bob referenced the 1980s when interest rates were extremely high. Well, back then, the bond PE was extremely attractive at 9.9, let's call it 10 times earnings. Uh, very, very attractive. And we saw it through the 90s, it appreciated a little bit, up to 15 and a half. In the 2000s, it started to get a little pricey at 23.8, but currently uh, it's 42.6. And that's as of June 30th. It's based on a 10-year Treasury note yield of 2.35%. So let's compare that, 42.6, to the 16.5 PE ratio that we're currently seeing for equities. Uh, obviously, one is much more attractive than the other, all things being equal. And at 42.6, we just feel that uh, the bond market has gotten well ahead of itself. So th this might beg the question, um, why maintain a bond allocation at all? Um, and as painful as it is, we feel that maintaining a bond allocation is an important part of a well-diversified portfolio allocation. It provides balance in a well-allocated portfolio. And Bob, um, earlier mentioned what happened in 2000, 2001, when the equity markets fell by 20 to 25%. By maintaining a bond allocation during that period, bonds actually appreciated. So while your equity portion was going down, bonds appreciated. That, that's what a prudent asset allocation is supposed to do. When one thing is performing well or not performing well, another is supposed to pick up um, and you know provide some positive returns. Another reason to uh, maintain a bond allocation, in spite of the fact that most institutional investors believe that interest rates will eventually go up, 
is the timing of that. Um, if you look back to 2008, 2009, rates were low. I think most institutional professional investors would have expected them to go up. Um, and they never really did. In fact, you know, they continued to come down. So while we and most institutional investors do expect rates to go up, bonds go down, we just don't know the timing of that. So once again, we feel it's important um, for clients to maintain an allocation to bonds. Um, as I mentioned, we do craft portfolios that have short to medium term maturities and lower duration. Um, when rates do go up, lower duration bonds will not go down as much as, as higher duration bonds. So that's an important thing to recognize. As well as with short maturities, when they do mature and roll off, they can be reinvested at better interest rates. So yields will go up. Moving along to defensive strategies, um, we recommend to our clients that they maintain an overweight um, allocation to our defensive back basket. Defensive strategies are designed to first and foremost mitigate volatility. They're also designed to minimize downside capture. Now that, that may be a term that some of you may not be familiar with, so let me explain it quickly. Downside capture is the amount of uh, the percent that a strategy will capture when it, its benchmark index goes down. So let me give you an example. If a strategy was benchmarked against the S&P 500 and just let's just say that it had 75 percent downside capture, the S&P was down 8 percent, we would expect that that strategy would be down about 6 percent. So once, you know, once again there's a little bit of protection there. But we also expect these strategies to sufficiently appreciate over time or capture a significant portion of the upside. Um, so, you know, just flipping that downside capture around, um, if the S&P was up 8% and it had a 75% upside capture, we would expect it to be up about 6%. Um, there are three common types of examples of defensive strategies. Hedged growth strategies, dividend growth strategies, and multi-strategy hedged investments. Hedged growth strategies are typically long short strategies. Um, the example that's usually given is a manager will go long Coke and short Pepsi if they believe there's some difference between the two companies. Or, you know, a manager may be long a security and short a derivative uh, to hedge it, that sort of thing. With dividend growth strategies, a stream of dividends provides a defensive nature to the investment. Multi-strategy hedged investments are strategies that are less correlated to equity markets. They may include things like risk arbitrage, distressed credit, or credit spread trading. Regarding traditional equities, um, we would recommend that our clients maintain a modest underweight to this strategy or to this category. Um, we feel that clients should focus on high quality companies and concentrated portfolios. So in previous years, the last few years, there have been very high correlation, high correlations amongst all domestic stock markets. But we're starting to see some divergence from that. And we feel it's become more of a stock picker's market. Um, we're already this quarter, we've seen big gains in stocks like Amazon and Google and Priceline and Visa. Um, and it's that sort of thing that we're looking for. And that sort of thing that leads us to believe that concentrated portfolios are the way to go. Um, high active share, which um, focuses on uh, portfolios that have fewer names and fewer index-like names uh, are something that we believe in. We also believe that portfolios should be overweighted to growth versus value, at least in the short term. So far this year, uh, the growth indexes and in all market cap spectrums have significantly outperformed those in the, of value. And this is something that we think will continue through the end of the year, but it's something that we continue to evaluate. And uh, when we see things that might, may lead us to think otherwise, we'll then start to make changes. We also believe that investors should continue to underweight foreign domicile companies or international companies. 
Um, but we should note that we've recently increased our international allocation slightly, um, although they are still underweighted. If you look at it, and, and Bob highlighted earlier the, uh, the slide that had all the European countries in the European Monetary Union, um, we feel the European economy is a few years behind the U.S., and at some point European equity markets will catch up and could experience returns similar to like we've been seeing in the U.S. We don't think we're there yet, but when it happens, we want our clients to benefit. That's something we're paying close attention to. A fourth category we don't have to slide for is private investments. Once again, we're going to uh, analyze those on a case-by-case, client-by-client basis and make appropriate recommendations where needed. One key factor we're paying attention to in 2015 is volatility. Uh, volatility, we believe, will play a key role as we finish out the year and move forward. And so the chart that we have here, going back to 1982, shows the number of days in a full calendar year that had ranges of greater than 1% for the S&P 500 index. And so you can see, if you go back uh, just a couple of years to 2008, 2009, uh, very, very high numbers there. But more recently, in 2013 and 2014, um, there were only you know, 71 and 79 days where this occurred. So far in the first six months of 2015, uh, there were 47 days uh, where there was a, a wide range. Uh, assuming that that is equivalent to the second half, if we double that to 94, while it's not a big number historically, under the averages, it is you know quite a bit more than we've seen in the last couple of years. So I think people will pay more attention to it. But but really, I think the market really doesn't have a memory from day to day. It's really based on news flow. You get new good news one day, the market's up. The very next day, there's some bad news that comes out, it goes down. There really doesn't seem to be much consistency to it. Um, but as institutional investors here at FLI. We don't let the day-to-day -day, uh, movements really concern us. We're long-term investors. We realize it's a marathon, not a sprint. And the recommendations we make to our clients are based, uh, based on what we feel are their best long-term interests. I'd like to turn it back over to Bob to summarize. OK, thanks, Phil. Uh, in summary, just to wrap up very quickly, the, the economy continues to recover modestly. There's employment growth. There's GDP growth, there's low inflation and low interest rates, and we think that's a good environment for long-term investors. Corporate earnings will continue to grow, but at a slower rate. As mentioned earlier, earnings are at record or near record levels. They have been somewhat hurt by the depressed oil situation and the strong dollar. So that makes the operations even more attractive when you factor those things out. So we are convinced that earnings will continue to grow. We do not see a recession on the horizon. And actually, if, we, if history is a guide, typically you have a recession between four and five years after the first interest rate increase, which we haven't even seen yet. So if history is a guide, we have several years before we have to deal with a recession, which would affect earnings. Valuations will continue to be reasonable but not cheap. Uh, with growing earnings as well as growing share prices, valuations right now for the most part are quite fair. You remember the chart we showed showing uh, the historical average being close to 16 for a price earnings multiple. We're slightly above that at, above that at 16.5 times earnings based on the next 12 months of earnings. So valuations are reasonable, but they're not cheap. As Phil pointed out, the current yields on bonds and cash appear to be quite unattractive. Bonds are trading in bubble territory. So getting 2% or 2.24 today for a 10-year Treasury is unattractive in our opinion. Yet on an after-tax basis, it is probably slightly below the rate of inflation. That is not good for long-term investors, and that's why we're modestly underweighting uh, the bond area. Prudent asset allocation with an overweight to defensive strategies is the best course for most investors because we expect increased volatility, but we are in a reasonable economy. In order to protect from the unknown, 
and there are things that we just don't know or won't know what's going to happen, we believe that our defensive sector or defensive basket and the three strategies in that basket provide investors, our clients, and ourselves with reasonable appreciation potential and the probability of volatility being mitigated by their defensive characteristics. So in summary, that's where we stand at mid-year. We would ask you to read the quarterly letter, which goes into greater detail. Um, and we will now open it up for any questions that you may have uh, to any of us here in the, uh, the investment committee at FLI. So Bob and Phil, thank you so much for taking us through that. I'm sure they all found it very interesting. Um, as Bob mentioned, we'll start answering questions. There is a questions pane on your screen. Please type them in there, and then I will ask them of the investment committee. Um, while those on the phone are thinking about what questions they'd like to ask or where they'd like to get more detail, I'm going to kick off the Q&A with one of the questions that was actually sent in advance. Um, and it relates to some of the things we've been talking about. So the question that we got was that the, this client of ours had noticed that growth has been outpacing value, and they wanted to get a little bit more of our perspective on that. Uh, Ralph, would you mind taking that for us? Yeah, sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome on the call. Thank you for dialing in. Uh, there is a, a quite a disparity this year between growth stocks and value stocks, and uh, simply stated, the reason being is that in a year where S&P earnings are expected to be up modestly, like they are this year, companies that are growing their earnings at a faster pace uh, are now being recognized for their operations, and it's a lot of the companies that we own. Those companies that are able to truly grow their earnings really stand out in this market, and they're being rewarded for higher valuations. On the other side, uh, with value, Value has struggled mainly for three different reasons. One, energy is a great percentage of the value index than growth, and a lot of the value companies are energy related, and energy has gotten killed so far this year. Uh, financials are a larger part of the value index, and there is some concern over rising interest rates and how that will impact financials. And the last reason is the strengthening dollar has hurt the multinational companies, of which a lot of them are value stocks. And the, uh, because the dollar has been so strong, uh, when you convert those earnings back to the international earnings back to dollars, it's worth less. Uh, so we are overweighting the growth in many strategies, and we have been doing that for the past two years. Uh, we're still maintaining an allocation of value, although not as much as we had in the past, because we think the markets eventually will adjust. But those are pretty much the reasons why growth is outpacing value this year. Great. Thanks, Ralph. So a question we just got is that we've talked a bit today about how energy prices are, have decreased. Um, do we have any perspective in terms of when what we think is going to happen over time? Will that decrease continue? Will it plateau? Where do we, where do we think that could be, obviously, without a crystal ball? It's very hard to project or predict where commodity prices will end up because there are two parts to the equation or several parts to the equation. Uh, in one respect, there are users. So there are those people that would use or those companies that would use energy. And then there are speculators, hedge funds, different types of investors that also influence the movements. So over the long term, one would expect that supply and demand would carry the day. But in the short term, where there's speculation, that can exacerbate price movements either up or down. Um, Brian Gamble, who's on this call with us, he and I debate almost on a weekly basis where energy is going to end up. But with commodities, they can overshoot their targets. And it's like trying to catch a falling knife. Uh, they look very attractive, then they keep going lower and lower. And then all of a sudden, something could turn it around. Um, right now, given the slowing economy, not robust growth, China slowing, most commodities are reacting quite negatively to that. So we don't have a position as to how far oil will go down or when it will turn around or how high it would go back up. And for that reason, for the most part, we have uh, avoided commodity-type investments because we just don't have a crystal ball as to how commodity prices will react. We do know in a, in a modestly growing economy, 
there's not great demand pressure quite yet on commodities. Great. Thank you. Um, we have another question, which is, what impact, if any, do we think the Bank of England's decision to not raise interest rates will have on the Fed's timetable? That's an interesting question and a very timely one, since the Bank of England this morning just decided not to raise rates. You know, this is another um, question that we can't answer. Um, it's interesting, in the United States, Fed presidents speak almost on a daily basis and they never agree with each other. So yesterday and the day before, you had one president of the Fed saying, well, maybe it's not time to raise rates, and another president coming out saying it's absolutely the right time to raise rates. One thing is clear, the Fed has indicated it is going to lift off. But lifting off from zero, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, is not a big concern to us. The European Union, uh, and actually the IMF, I think it's Christine Lagarde, has urged uh, Chairperson Yellen to not raise rates quickly because Europe is still in a fragile type recovery. Um, matter of fact, maybe they're growing half a percent to one percent. So we think that Chairperson Yellen takes into consideration what's going on around the world. There is some coordination, but it's undeniable that the U.S. economy is not in crisis mode. Uh, its economy is growing between two and three percent. Employment is getting better, yet the only fear is that inflation hasn't gone up as much as the Fed would like. We think that Europe will be considered, but at the end of the day, the, the U.S. economy is separate and apart uh, from the European economy, and therefore Chairperson Yellen will act when she thinks it's prudent for the U.S. economy to raise rates, and we believe that will either be in September or December, unless the economic data that comes out in the next few months suggests otherwise. Great. We have a, another question. Probably have time for, for one or two more here. Um, talking a little bit more about energy, um, what do we think the potential impact on overall energy, specifically oil, is given the potential deal with Iran? Well, the, the the agreement with Iran, the nuclear, the proposed nuclear transaction with Iran will result in Iran being able to sell its oil into the marketplace. And it has been estimated that they will increase uh, their oil production by half a, half a million uh, barrels a day. Uh, we think that's already being impacted in the price of oil. Before the Iranian deal was announced, oil was probably in the mid-50s. West, West Texas Intermediate. Uh, today it's in the mid-40s. So the, and the Ayatollah has made it very clear in statements made earlier this week that Iran will ramp up its oil production within one week of the agreement being formalized and codified. So we think that's in the marketplace. Um, we think that oil could probably go down a bit more from where it is today. But again, as I stated in a question or two before, because there's speculation involved in oil, uh, as well as the end users being involved in oil, it's very hard to say how far down it will go or how high it will go once it starts to go up. Wish I could be more specific, but we can't. Great. Thanks, Bob. I think that's the last question we'll have time for today. On behalf of the entire team at SLI, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us, and we hope you all found this session interesting and insightful. For our clients on the line, I'd like to remind you that our investment committee is always available to discuss your individual asset allocation. Please just give us a call. When you close out of the webinar, there will be a very quick three-question survey, and we'd be most appreciative if you could complete it. Thank you so much, and have a great afternoon. And a great summer.